Would you like to know the secret of how Grandmasters beat low rated opponents? Well, I can tell you right now, given that I'm a Grandmaster, it's very simple. I don't know if you guys have seen the Doge meme of like the Super Doge, like big, you know, six pack muscles, like arms up, like super strong. Uh, you're like Arnold Schwarzenegger, but you know, the Doge Shiba Inu. Well, that's what it says. I'm intimidating my opponent with my much higher chest rating and my massive confidence that I see everything and they see nothing. And then on the other side, you know, on the other side board playing black guy, like the lower rate, like the sort of, you know, meek little doge, like sort of getting down like this and sort of being like, oh no, I want to play this move, but he sees everything. He looks so confident. He planned a refutation to my move. So I'm just going to play some scaredy fraidy cat move. And hope that he just leaves me alone and, you know, gets distracted, I know, by this beautiful woman, like, looking at the, the game or something. That's my, that's my best hope, I think, to, to not lose this game. So, you can kind of see, like, the difference of private does come down to the mindset. But, on a more serious note, there is also a specific opening weapon that I find to be really effective that a lot of Grandmasters do use in order to move forward to their opponents. It's going to be a little bit advanced, a little bit of GM chess secrets. So, do make sure to stick around for more of the secrets. Illingworth Chess, improve your chess, GM Max. What's up guys? So for this video, if you haven't already, do make sure to hit that subscribe button. That will allow you to get more of my videos. And also comment below once you've done that with I'm subscribed so that we can welcome you into the community and to be part of something really special and magical. Speaking of special and magic, well that's what happens in our game today where Vladislav Artemiev, grade 2700, Playing against Tomas Banus in European Online Rapid Cup. Don't really know the details of this tournament, but it looks kind of cool. Uh, so when learning C4, I mean in the game, basically Black end up playing this move E5. And you know, we're going to talk in a moment about how to deal with this C4 E5. Because you know, I may have done some videos, you can see him suggest about how Black can play C4 E5. And I showed what Black's ideas are in these different variations. But here we are looking at a bit more from White's perspective. And well, for these positions, it really a lot comes down to like what type of position... Do you want to play like from this point? I mean, if you like sort of going for a reverse dragon, definitely the move G3 is the main move at this point, where you go bishop G2 castles and just play in a very systematic kind of fashion as such, based like a Sicilian with cars reversed. There's also other approach where you can play like E3 as well, where you kind of invite them to play a bishop B4 pin. But then you go queen C2 and off where moves like knight D5, you can try to get a good amount of control over the center, fighting for those light squares. But Artemiev actually goes for a very different approach. I like to point out by the way I did do a video previously showing how White can sometimes get an advantage with E4 if Black is not well prepared with this Nimsovich uh, English variation. So you can check that out as well up top. Uh, but actually Artemiev came with a completely different move. He played the move of D3. And I could talk a lot more about this D3 move. But before I do I want to actually share a little bit about just learning C4 in general in terms of what are the different lines you kind of have to be ready for and what are different options that are sort of available at your disposal. Give you guys a good overview because I know that there are a lot of English opening players who maybe want to know kind of what the options are or they're not really sure what to do against certain setups. So let's make sure that we're all ready for it and that we're all on the same page. And speaking of being on the same page, do make sure to smash that like button if you're enjoying this video so far. So, well, let's go back to position after knight f6 actually because let's say if you don't want to allow this sort of e5, like you don't really... Maybe you don't play the Sicilian as black and you're not that comfortable playing with an extra, even with an extra tempo, even though Sicilian is of course the best chess opening in the world. But in that case, you could play the move knight to f3 and avoid the e5 push. Uh, or for that matter, you could even start with a knight f3 move order and then play c4 on the next move. That's all sort of allows you to get to English opening territory without allowing the move e5. So that's definitely something worth keeping in mind if for some reason you don't want to allow the e5 moves. But otherwise, let's sort of continue on from this point where... When you play knight c3, basically it's sort of with the idea that you're going to try and take over the center at the right moment. <clears throat> For example, let's say if black is a king's Indian player, or actually let's say they're a Grunfeld player, and they play move g6, like hoping that you're going to transpose back into a pure Grunfeld with d4, d5. Well, we can be a bit tricky with the move order, and we can play the move e4. And I don't have d5 anymore, and you know, e5 is kind of a threat. So it kind of prompts them into this d6, d4, and then end up back into a king's Indian. Which, if they didn't want to play the King's Indian originally, this is obviously not really what Black wants. And you can check out my learning D4 video above if you want to see a really cool system with Bishop E2 and Bishop E3 against this opening. Uh, but what if they try a different move order? Like, let's say they play a move like E6, for example, trying to play a Nimso Indian or transpose to a Nimso. Well, again, we have some extra options available. 
for example, you can play the Mykonos attack with e4. It's one way I've done a video on as well, like you could probably see it in the suggested video above. And the idea is that if black doesn't do some move to take control of the center, white's going to play e5 and just sort of kick that knight around, which is a little bit annoying. But you don't really want that white go d4 and just completely dominate the center either. So black's best move would be to go d5, but again, white's got some choices here. The old main line is to go e5 and kind of play these sort of structures like with ef6. And then you have like this sort of exchanges like b takes c3 for example. But these positions with like knight f3 and d4, they're certainly playable. But black's more or less figured out that nowadays you can just go b6 and you know, it kind of goes very flexible like bishop b7, bishop d6 and just have like this very solid game with no real weaknesses. Why doesn't really manage to prove anything special in these lines. So that's one reason why now the trend at high levels kind of shifted towards c takes d5 and then playing e5. And this line now is going to be a little bit trappy actually, because black's best move is probably to play knight e4, but then you just go knight f3, you kind of delay that move of d4, so you have the option to kick that knight away with d3 in some positions. Also with knight c6, you can kind of pin the knight with bishop b5, and, and if they play some passive move, you're often just going to play like pawn the d4 and just have that extra space in the center and central majority to work with. So it is a position where I do honestly believe that white does have a small advantage in this position that black does not 100% equalize. So that's kind of good news for us and it sort of shows that, well, with this move order, we're basically able to avoid the Nimso Indian. And we also kind of avoid things like the Queen's Indian and this kind of stuff. So Knight F6, it might look like a flexible move, but we do have extra options available against these different lines that they can play. Uh, another line you have to be ready for is, of course, to move E5, but we're going to see it after Knight C3. And Knight F6, it does transpose back into the game, as it were. Uh, or if they play the symmetrical with C5, again, you have different options available. Like, if you want just to play a very systematic way probably the move for you is to play knight c3 knight c6 and just you know go for a fiend carry like g3 and mean this line doesn't give you the maximum chance for an advantage but it's very systematic i mean you can play knight f3 castles and choose whether to play d3 or d4 later depending on what they do i mean for example if they go like e5 and go for a bot phoenix setup then yeah you're often typically going to play like rook b1 a3 go for the b4 push and try to chip away at the opponent's structure in that sort of way. So you go very strategic play, like not a lot of early, you know, hand-to-hand -hand combat. But what kind of more maneuvering position, where you can try to sort of show you have a better chess understanding than your opponents. That's kind of the main skill at play here. Of course, to improve your chess understanding, you can certainly follow more of my videos as well, as you know already. Uh, also, like, if you do want to play a bit more critically, then you might prefer to play, let's say, a move like knight to f3. And play like knight c3 and kind of keep your options open. So that, for example, you can choose whether to go for g3 or whether to play d4 in the center or whether to prepare d4 of e3. And the choice, like, it's not just purely that it's going to be the best move in some given position, but it also might depend on your taste. For example, you might decide that, for example, after knight c6, that you want to go g3 and kind of go bishop g2 and d4. And kind of play a bit like a sort of delayed Catalan, where we play a Catalan, but where we're not playing the move d4, but sort of keeping our options a bit more open. Or you might decide, for example, that if they go for d5, then you know, maybe when they go for d5, you don't want to go g3. But instead, you decide to play in the center with d4, or you decide to play a move like e3 and kind of go for like a d4 and try to play in the center. So there are obviously a lot of different options you can play depending on your own taste and what the opponent does as well. Uh, so in any case, there are also other moves like they can go knight to c6, and there are other lines they can play like e5 or g6. But I find in these cases, like, for example, if they play e5, you get, like, extra options such as going e3 and playing d4 and trying to take control of the center. Now, since this video is more about kind of showing the different options, like, I'm not going to go deep into these moves, but just to point out these are the options you have at your disposal. It's very likely there's probably going to be one of these that you're maybe a little bit drawn to than some of the others. It's not like one is clearly better than the other, so it really depends, like, okay, you can choose the one that is to your taste and, you know, try it out in some games and see how it goes. Because basically one of the best ways to really learn an opening, whether it's C4 or some other line, is just to play it and learn from your own experiences. Try to figure out one better move that you could pl could have played compared to what you did in the game. And it's bit by bit you're going to build up your opening knowledge without you know, needing to say some 300 page opening book and not remember 9% of it after you finish reading it anyway. Uh, that's like true for most people. Like, okay, for someone like Kim Peek, it's a bit different, but okay, not everybody has these special powers of your know, memory. Anyway, uh, finally, I guess I should also point out quickly that if they don't play like these other moves, like if they play some other moves instead, then you'll often have the option to play like a later d4 and transfers back to a good d4 opening. Or you can play kind of independently. Like if black goes e6 and you can certainly go knight c3 and 
Well, if they go d5, he'll probably go d4 and just be happy. The transfer is into a queen scam, but declined, but one where you kind of kept all your options open. You know, where you can still, for example, play the exchange variation because you played like knight c3 and you didn't have the knight commit to f3 already, for example. Or you might decide, well, I want to kind of play it more in an English spirit and you might go like knight f3 and go for some fiend carry, like a g3 move or playing like e3 and b3. Obviously, you know, it depends on your own style, like which uh, which fiend carry you would prefer in this case. But both of them are definitely are quite legitimate alternatives. Uh, and likewise, against the Slav, you kind of have a, a similar choice where, you know, you can choose, you know, whether you decide to transpose back to a normal Slav with d4 or whether you go for some fiend carry, like either a g3 move and just play it in a sort of like Neo-Catalan where you didn't play the move d4 and where you're kind of okay with sacking that c pawn for some positional compensation. Or if you do really want to defend the pawn, you can go e3 and you know, try to get some value out of the move order. Where, for example, you might be happy to transpose into a semi-slab later like e6 and d4. But you want to avoid things like the d6, c4 lines or you want to try to discourage a Chebinenko slab. So that way you can kind of be tricky with the move order. Try to later transpose back into a d4 opening where you avoid some options along the way. Um, and against most of the other lines, I find that just transposing back to a normal d4 system works well. Like, say if they go d f5, or if they go g6, b6, these sort of sidelines. I find that a central approach, like just putting the pawn on d4, tends to work pretty well in most cases. Like, you might, for example, decide to go like knight c3 or knight f3 first, just to kind of reduce black's options a little bit, and then play d4 to get back to something familiar. So one thing you're probably realizing is, in order to play c4 very well, you do have to know a bit about d4. So I think that if you do want to play c4, it probably makes sense to start out getting some experience in d4 first, and then playing c4 from there. You know, I do have a, a suggested video as well on how to play d4, which you can check uh, up on the top of the video. In any case, let's see how the game went. Now that I've kind of overviewed the different options, let's see the actual game, which was one that Artemi of Spoiler did manage to win. Uh, I mean, it wouldn't be much of a learning e c4 video if I showed black winning in 20 moves, right? So we have knight f3, knight c6, and now the move d3 is sort of a move trying to sort of avoid fury. Kind of saying, well, I don't mind if you play d5 because then i can get a you know classical sicilian with colors reversed where you know you can play a move like e4 as one alternative to the usual dragon approach and you can kind of see here like black has a lot of different moves available you know it can play knight takes c3 but it does give white a bit of extra space in the center and if me like i used to get these position by style playing this version of covers black so it is something i'll be pretty happy with like just castles and you know prepare the d4 break or even just you know play on the you know on the different flanks of the borders at work with the pieces uh, in any case, there are also other moves like if knight f6, then yeah, you can play moves like bishop to e2 or, and you know, just sort of plot the bishop on e3 castles and just be very solid. But of course, black is doing fine as well in this sort of Boleslavsky type structure. But I guess that's probably what Artemi have intended. You know, who knows, maybe it's going to play e6 and just play a normal scavening in with Karls reversed, which is probably not quite as good, but it's not terrible either. Well, instead, Banu's... Uh, you know, the Hungarian Grandmaster, you know, plays a lot of tournaments on the, you know, uh, the Team League circuits. Well, he played move Bishop B4. And after this, like, you could play move E4 and you could get that bind structure. Like, if you want to play 4E4, this one move order to do it. But I'll tell you, it decides to go Bishop D2 instead and just break the pin. You know, obviously, it's one advantage White has with the extra tempo. And Black side to Castle. White played move G3, like, very creative alternative to the usual E3, Bishop E2 Castles. But not necessarily inferior. Uh, the game went rook to e8. Uh, white played bishop to g2. And at this point, I feel like black kind of started to try to force the play a bit too much. Like, I find that the English opening's one that's really very effective if your opponent's like one of these Luke Skywalkers. And what I mean by Luke Skywalkers, you know, you know in Star Wars, I always say, like, you know, use the force. Luke is what the, you know, his mentors kept on saying. So what, like, when trying forcing plays, I went kind of forcing the exchanges. We're always trying to attack the opponent, like, like in boxing. But in reality, like, sometimes when you try to be too forcing, like, in these sort of close positions, all you do is you kind of weaken yourself. I mean, for example, a move like bishop takes c3. Like, it's an exchange, but it's one that white would be quite happy to see, I think. Because then white gets the bishop pair, and he gets that bishop on that nice long diagonal. And also, if you try to play some forcing move like e4, again, you're kind of just giving white what he wants. You know, after knight takes e4. You know, all these exchanges happen, but at the end of the day, all that really happens from there is that, you know, black's rook is now a target. You know, even you can take and then the knight so is a little bit offside. And then even just some move like b3 just consolidates and, you know, your bishop is just a lot better than black. So it's clear white's got a nice lead in development here. I mean, computer thinks you can even sack the pawn with castles due to some genius tactical point that rook c4. You go queen b3 and, you know, somehow this rook is not really able to keep that. 
Knight defended along this year, this four frank. I mean, the Rover might be a good meme opening, but it's not going to work in serious play, right? Uh, but yeah, instead of that, we had uh, we had the move Knight D4. If I was playing Black, I'd probably just go A5, H6, D6, and just build some really solid play on the uh, on the dark squares. Because you're probably going to trade off this bishop anyway, you know, when they kick you with A3, for example. And when that happens, you kind of want your pawns on the uh, on the dark squares. So that way, when you do get a position like this, your you know, pawns and your bishop are very well complemented. That your bishop has a lot of open lines and you're also kind of nullifying the opponent's unopposed bishop at the same time. So that's probably the best way to play it. Though I do feel like maybe white's still a bit better at this point. So maybe you should go A4 instead and you know, not let them... Get in the move B4 and maybe go for like D5 is a bit more of an aggressive approach. That might be a better choice than playing D6, which might be a little bit too passive in this particular position. Anyway, the game saw Knight to D4 and, you know, Knight D4 is just an outright mistake here. I was going to say it bluntly. I mean, I know like as a private chess coach, you meant to really encourage your students to say, you know, that wasn't such a bad move. Like, I sort of get like what you were going for. You know, it's kind of reasonable, like definitely, you know, full marks for effort. But, you know, if you've read like, you know, the Battle Hymn of the Tiger Mother, as I did in 2014 to, you know, understand the thought process of my Chinese girlfriend at the time. Well, you all know that, like, sometimes you just got to say it as it is. You got to, like, really just push and kind of squeeze, like, you know, you're better than this, man. Uh, so we had, like, Knight takes D4, and you've got the double pawns, and... Okay, it's a rapid game, so I'm not going to be too, too harsh about this. Like, I'm not going to, like, you know, really, you know, rub it in too much on black. But, you know, that D-pawn is a really big weakness at the moment. And if you play bishop c5 to try to defend both the bishop and the pawn, you're just going to go b4 and, you know, this bishop could even get a Noah's Ark's trap, which, you know, if you are afraid of, you know, of, uh, you know, going to hell, then definitely it's not something you want to do. But anyway, after bishop d2, it turns out that actually the hell was in, uh, on real life here. Because after the move c5, desperately trying to defend that pawn, well, the problem is that you now you're weak in a big square. Can you guys see what square has been weakened by that move pawn to c5? And now I normally ask you to pause the video and ask you a question, but it was a rhetorical question anyway. So the move for white is that, well, d6 is now a big juicy hole. So we go knight d6. If you want to play b4, that's also a pretty good move to chip away at that pawn chain. But, okay, now we just have a fork. And after rook e6, white does simply win a pawn. And when you're a grandmaster, there are two things that you dream about in your sleep and when you're playing. The first thing you dream about is the bishop pair advantage. And the second thing you dream about is a material advantage. Because that material, like, it's kind of like sort of a, you know, investment, you know, where, like, you know that kind of investment's not going to be, like, just go away. I mean, it's not like, I know, some, uh, what's a good example? Like, it's not like, you know, say you go big on, like, the Tulip Mania, or let's say one version of Tulip Mania, which some people claim to be Bitcoin. Where, like, you go big on, it's like, oh, I've got this big thing, I'm so strong, and then suddenly it just all crashes down to zero or something like this. I'm not going to say that's going to happen, like, I'm just using it as a, you know, dramatic little example. But you can kind of see, like, with the extra pointer, like, that's a, a sure bet. Like, you know that's going to be safe, it's going to be solid. You know, it's kind of like, you know, if you get married, like, there's a chance you might get divorced. But, you know, when you have, like, you know, mother and father, like, it's not like they're going to say, oh, I'm not your mother and father anymore. Like, it's biologically, it, it's the way it is. So, anyway, that was a very long metaphor, but I think you, you got the gist of it. So, A5, you know, he's trying to stop this extra pawn having some value, trying to create some counterplay, but it, it doesn't really work all that well. And I do think that Artemia is technically winning. So for the rest of the game, we're going to see how to win with an extra pawn and with the better bishop versus the kind of dominated knight at the moment. So after a4, well, we had b takes a4. And then Artemi have said good knight as just to show the pun. Good knight to the whether he has a good knight, but he's also good knight because you're dead and buried. So rook fb1, black played h6, white played the move h4, just you know, stopping any g5 ideas. I would have played move queen f4 if I was white because... Well, it's kind of good to take control of that open file if you can. And a good tactical point for you guys to notice that after takes, takes that Black doesn't have the time to take on a2. It's a poison pawn because of the move rook b8 and you just simply pick off the queen like that. So instead we're at h4. Black played rook b6. And I mean, this is just technically winning. Like, even without playing the best moves like rook b5 and you know, trying to connect those past pawns. Still, queen c2 is good enough hitting the rook and... Well, now Artemia found on the second try. No good work, uh, Vladislav, on playing Rook to B5. I know you win a lot of Tile Tuesdays. You win a lot of these uh, these events. So it's not a big surprise you're still playing good moves in Rapid. Black Lake Rook takes B5. And now White gets those connected passes. And all White needs to win now is basically get the pawn on A4. Once he does that, like, those passes are just not going to be stopped. One thing you might notice that's really good from White's perspective here, as I nearly fall off my chair in shock, is that, you know, now we can see that square, that promotion square is covered by the bishop. 
So that makes it much harder for Black to be able to stop that past A pawn in the end game. The game went D5, trying to shut out the bishop. Then there was Queen B3, and you know, something's got to give here, mate. If you go Rook A5, I would go A4. I mean, look at these pieces like you. Pieces are just completely stuck, you know, blocking the pawns. It's kind of like, you know, uh, sort of the employee, you know, he doesn't want to kind of go to work, but like the boss is kind of forced, you know, he's got the bills, and if he doesn't go, he's just going to get fired. But it's kind of what's like, you know, these Queen and Rook are sort of being enlisted by the king, but, you know, they're really not enjoying it. Like, they're really suffering here. So Black played Queen A5, trying to keep the pieces more active, but the problem is, is now that B pawn's going for a runner. You know, it's kind of like the maze runner here. You know, of course, not as good as the Hunger Games, but, you know, we make do with what we have. We had C4. White played with Queen B1. We decided not to trade on C4 because he didn't want to undouble the black pawns. I mean, White's winning anyway, so it wouldn't have mattered that much. But, okay, this was his decision. We had B, Knight D7. And now look at this. Like, we have this whole Knight, a whole three pointer stopping a one pawn, a one pointer from queening. But around the pawn's not really a one point. Like, when you get to the square, like one square from queen, that pawn is worth a lot more than one. Like, it's stopping a whole knight just with this one threat of queening as such. You thought that the pass pawn was just good in the end game. Well, it turns out they're even more monster in the middle game. So we had D take C4. Now, very good play by Artemio to finish the game. He played with queen E4, threatening queen E8 out of the fork as well as hitting the pawn on D4. Queen D8, white played rook to C1 just to go after this guy. At King F8, Queen F5 was played, trying to get that Queen to sink into C8, supported by the pawn. Like, it's one nice thing about this sort of tension that, you know, not only do we have that, but also the Black King is kind of quite weak. Like, there's just way, way too many weaknesses in Black's position at once. Now, for Bishop D5, we can really feel the domination, like, the Bishop and the Knight. You know, in this case where the Bishop beats the Knight, like, the Bishop tends to be better about 70% of the positions according to Levon Aronian. And this one's only adding to the statistic. Game ended Queen E7, Queen C8. Queen e8, and after bishop to c4. Like, at this point, white's just sort of slow rolling. Queen a5, white played a4. And Bunner's finally had enough and just resigned at this point. He realized that if you were to play rook takes a4 here, white's just going to play bishop b5. Of course, you could play queen e8 first, but this is time to show off where we're just going to collect the harvest in this case. But if you don't take, white's just going to play some move like bishop to, to b5 anyway at this point. Uh, or uh, just trap in the rook. Or you can even play a move like rook d1, just take the pawn at some point and, you know, just queen the, you know, play rook d8 and it's just game over. So it's really not too uh, too early for white black to resign. So there you have it. With this video, you now know kind of what the different options you have with playing c4. You know, we saw lines where we're going like knight c3, knight f3 and playing in the center. We saw plans of white going for the king side pinko with g3. We saw a few examples of white went e3 and d4 for a more central strategy. That's really the big strength of the English is that you do have a lot of flexibility available. And speaking of flexibility, if you do want to have as five see more moves in your games to have a lot more options available to beat your opponents, do make sure to smash that like button, comment below with what you enjoy about this video, and most importantly, subscribe to Illingworth Chess channel to get more Grandmaster Chess videos like this one. One of our, our subscribers, he liked to say to me that you know, I'm one of the few tiled chess players where he actually fully understood nearly all of the explanations, so do make sure to join in for high quality analysis that also makes sense to you. I will see you guys in the next video and good luck playing C4 in your games.